were here at our dad's house in Elgin, Illinois. Mm -hmm. We both grew up in here. And uh, this is a house that they built in, I guess it was about 1949, because I was two years old at the time. He always told a funny story. People would ask him, uh, when did you first start the house? And he would say, you know, 1949. I said, oh, how long did it take you? He said, to 1964. <laughs> <laughs> and he put on the final edition, so. <laughs> yes, right. They added on several times over the years. Mm -hmm. This was an interesting neighborhood. It was, it was mixed racially because our neighbors to the north, um, the, those, that side of the block were white families, and then on the Fremont Street side were black families. So we kind of were in the middle, and we played, we had friends from both. So it was a, it kind of an interesting experience because we grew up in this kind of environment where we had, um, you know, where, where the, racially it was, it was mixed. I lived just uh, two houses to the north of Fremont Street, so I was right there, and when I go to school every day, I'd go up Fremont Street. So I went to school with these kids every day. We used to go up to Sheridan School. That was in 1940. Living up there, uh, I had uh, Ernie was one. He was, he was in the same class I was, and there was uh, another very good friend of mine. There was Alonzo Smith. And, uh, and then there was Art Green and Buster Leach and, uh, well, Chucky Koontz. Those were all black kids. I, I was the only white kid, more or less, on the street up there. The rest of the white kids that lived down by me, they were a little bit older, so they didn't go up. And I guess probably the reason I was there more because I was in the same class as Ernie and Lonzo and those kids. Exactly. Yeah. And then later, when we, you know, when we got older, then a lot of the kids played uh, football and every, we all played together. So then I used to see them all the time then. But uh, so here you are as a as a kid in high school, and like I was saying, you know, most other uh, white kids may, maybe they they know they, they have one or two black friends or maybe not. Yeah. And here you are with you know you you're buddies with all of these guys. And, well, yeah, because I grew up right yeah, there. Yeah, and you know all of them. Did did the other kids kind of go, hey, what's the deal? You know, how do you no, yeah, no. how do you know these guys? Well, I don't think back then people were. I don't know. I don't know if they were prejudiced. I guess they people must have been, but we weren't. I wasn't uh, brought up that way, and I just, they were all my friends. We'd travel to go play football someplace else, and I have to sit on the bus while they go in and eat. No, that's during that time. How, how, did you, how did you deal with that? How did you feel about that? I felt angry, and that's all I could do, was feel angry. I had no answer to it. If I let that anger bust out, I'm gonna wind up in jail. And what, is that going to help my family? No, it's not going to help my family. Because to me, there's one thing you just don't do. You don't, don't wind up in jail. You could get you a Cadillac, or a deuce and a quarter, anything big in a car line, but you could not get a place to lay your head. If you got a loan from a bank out here, man, that was Happy New Year to me, because they wouldn't loan you. They had every excuse in the world not to even though your credit was good and everything mm -hmm. else? You ever been homeless with a pocket full of money? I've been there. As a young minister, I was called to a meeting that the ministers had set with the city council because they had a grievance. Some of the parishioners had relayed to the pastors that the response time to the black community when they called the police for something, it was either non-existent or it was late. Uh, there, there was just no response uh, like it should be. And this, they had a grievance against the police, so they were invited to speak to the issue before the city council. They had the police chief there and his deputy and the mayor and, and everybody was there for this meeting and uh, the public at large. And when we get up to the meeting, Reverend Bedford turned to me and asked me to be the spokesman. And, uh, I, man, I'm telling you, I, I was glad I wore a suit and tie. Uh, but I, I, if I was thinner, my, you could have heard my knees knocking. I'm facing this panel of VIPs and, and having to relay something. 
that I didn't know firsthand, but that somebody told me to to say. But Mayor Vanderbird, uh, God bless his soul, uh, nicest man I ever met in in, in public life. Uh, he uh, probably sensed my discomfort, but he took over and he addressed the police chief directly and asked him uh, what about this situation and I want to see this addressed and I want uh, people to come back uh, to me if, if it's not. While I am a person who believes that I am a human first, among all things, I'm a human first. I could be a black anything, but I'm a human first. It's important to know your history, where you came from, whether you're Dutch, French, any, whatever. It's always important to know where you come from and to have some pride in your culture, but you should never lose sight of the fact that you, are, you owe your humanity to the rest of the world. That is my belief. That is why, like for me and my children, uh, race is not a big thing to them at all, yet they're always aware of it, not necessarily in a negative. In the, in the more negative point, you know, I, I definitely let my children know <laughs> that there will be people out there that will hold your origins against you, you know, and you have to be ready for those people. Don't be caught off guard by that. Don't let it devastate you. Just know yourself and have the confidence in who you are and where you came from. I have two boys, and so certainly as two African-American males in today's society, my husband and I have had countless, uh, countless conversations with them about what it means to be black in America today, and particularly being an African-American male in today's society, and how society will treat them, how society will engage with them, what assumptions society will make about them, how to interact with the police so that you can come home safely. All those types of conversations are the conversations that we've had to have um, with our kids. And after the Trayvon Martin incident, you know, once again, you know, we use that as a teachable moment and I could relate to um, Trayvon's mom because we send our kids out into the world and my kids are old enough certainly to be moving, uh, moving through this world on their own now. So they don't, I'm not with them. They don't hold my hand. I don't protect them anymore like when they were little kids and they were always with either me or my husband. And so I, I you know, openly questioned um, this community. I, I wrote an open letter to this community and questioned, what would you have me to tell my sons? about why Trayvon Martin is dead? And what would you have me to tell them about how they can avoid being a Trayvon Martin? Because they wear hoodies, they have dreads, um, you know, and, and what happens if some maniac mistakes them for a threat? Do I have them, you know, cross the street when you see a white person coming at you? Do I have them cut their beloved dreads off and, um, you know, wear a suit so that you don't look threatening to anybody? What, what do I tell them? And so that was an open question that I asked in this community. And, um, and, and we talked to our kids about the realities of racism and, and what it leads to. The one thing I would tell you that Elgin truly has above the St. Charles's and the Geneva's and, um, it has the culture from the Lao community that is very active with the black community, that's very active with the Hispanic community, that's very active with the other Asian communities that are there, they're active with the Muslim community. You know, the last year before I left, we had the first International Day. I was part of that committee. And to see how you have so many people come down to that park and you never have any issues. Everybody celebrated, they had a good time, they had a parade, they had a great time. That's the one thing that Elgin has that's different other than Aurora among all of those other Fox River cities. First of all, let me say I love Elgin. One of the things it has going for it is that I think that if, 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 if parents 
let their children participate and really grow up in Elgin instead of trying to keep them away from this one and keep them away from them. I think these kids that go to our schools will be prepared to go anywhere in this country, anywhere, because there's some of everybody here.